Uh, finally, let's talk a little bit about how you get an envelope. And as I said, um, there, this can follow the assembly of internal structures, like flu the, is the example we talked about. And that, that's how it happens for most viruses. Or it can uh, happen at, uh, simultaneously with assembly of internal structures like retroviruses. And there are a number of ways that viruses can bud. In some cases, uh, the, the glycoprotein and the capsid proteins drive budding, so you have to express both of them. Uh, in some cases, the internal proteins are enough. You express a matrix protein of some viruses, and that will form a bud. In some cases, the envelope proteins alone. So we talked about uh, hepatitis B virus or influenza virus. You just express the envelope. That's enough to get a particle. And then finally, there are some cases where you need a combination of internal and glycoproteins to, to form a bud. And these are all, uh, this is kind of an e example of the wide range of complexities that there are in formation of these envelope particles. So remember, this is influenza virus. This is an example of when uh, you form the virion at the very end. You form an internal structure first uh, in the cytoplasm. That goes to the plasma membrane, and then you have formation of a bud. And that is driven, again, only by the HA, although, of course, you want to incorporate uh, the RNA as well. These uh, viral proteins that drive budding go to the membrane, again, <coughs> by specific signals. Uh, so the, the M protein is located here attached uh, to the viral RNA. That is driven to the membrane by very specific hydrophobic regions, as you can see here for influenza virus, uh, the same for VSV. There are very specific sequences that drive membrane binding. If you change them by mutating the sequence, you, you abolish particle formation because the M proteins uh, cannot go to the plasma membrane. <clears throat> Here, and this brings us back to retroviruses. Uh, and remember, the retroviruses are assembled as these precursors pick up RNA and the matrix protein has a meristate at the end terminus that targets it to the membrane. In fact, if you express just GAG uh, alone, the GAG protein, you will form particles. You don't need to have RNA to form particles. So just this, pro actually this protein right here, GAG, if you express that only in cell, you will form particles. So that's an example of a, of a protein, of a virus where you don't need the glycoproteins. Just these underlying proteins will drive budding. Now, a number of years ago, uh, uh, sequences were discovered in a variety of viral glycoproteins uh, by altering them by mutagenesis, and they were called L or late domains. And these were initially found in retroviruses. They were amino acid change, changes in that GAG structural protein that caused arrest of budding. So here's an example of the phenotype. These virions would start to bud out, but most of them would never come off, and they would remain attached uh, by a stalk. So this, was, this sequence where these changes were initially introduced into these late domains were eventually found in many different enveloped viruses, plus or minus strand RNA. So these are sequences that are essential to complete the budding process. And it turns out that these L domains, these late domains, bind uh, cellular proteins that are involved in vesicle trafficking. So viruses have usurped another step in the cell, and that is to form uh, buds like this. And here are some L domain motifs. They're shown here by a, uh, an oval or a uh, polyhedral type structure. And they're just, just to show you that they're found in a variety of retroviral genomes. They're in Ebola viruses, uh, rhabdoviruses, arenaviruses. So all of these viral glycoproteins have these sequences which allow them to interact with the cellular membrane fusion machinery. And these are very specific sequences. You can see them here. Uh, and uh, they are essential for the budding process. Now, this cell system that the virus is interacting with is called the escort system. It's the escort machinery. And the escort machinery is an important component of processes in the cell that require uh, things to occur that sort of resemble budding of virus particles. So for example, uh, within the cell, there are structures called multivesicular bodies. And these are large membranous structures which then contain smaller vesicles that bud into them. So this is sort of the reverse of a virus budding from the plasma membrane. But these, these bud into the cells. These are part of the normal processes of the cell. And the escort proteins 
which are shown here uh, at one of these budding ves uh, invaginating vesicles, these escort proteins <coughs> drive this process. So again, the virus has usurped this escort machinery in order to bud from the cell. Also in cell division, escort proteins are involved as well. So the retroviruses and other envelope viruses have grabbed this escort machinery, and they do so by interacting with the gag protein or with some structural protein of the virion. And instead of this process normally invaginating a, a vesicle into the cell, the virus has now tricked it into making a bud. And so that's how uh, the virus actually forms the bud through this escort system. It's very clever. Uh, viruses can bud in many cellular compartments. Uh, we have talked about um, budding from the plasma membrane, uh, but some viruses can bud from the Golgi and from the ER as well. And here are examples of various uh, viral glycoproteins uh, being produced in those different compartments. Uh, here's an example of what herpes virus does. It probably takes the budding to the extreme. So the particle, remember, is formed in the nucleus. Remember, the DNA is taken up into the capsid. It then buds out of the nucleus. It buds out of the nucleus, doesn't go through the pore, and acquires a membrane. So it finds itself in the ER. So now we have a capsid with a single membrane. To get out of the ER, it fuses with the ER membrane. And now in the cytoplasm is this naked viral capsid again. Still has a ways to go. It buds into the trans-Golgi network and acquires a membrane there. And then it buds out of the trans-Golgi and acquires a second membrane. And then finally, that second membrane fuses at the cell surface, at the plasma membrane, to release the virion, which has the right number of membranes, one. Right? And that one was, of course, derived from the Golgi, because that's where it acquired it. This was just an extra one to get it to the cell surface, so kind of an extreme version. Uh, just at the end here, I want to talk about how viruses get out of cells. Um, we talked about budding. That's, of course, one way of a virus to get out of a cell. Many viruses lyse the cell. They break them open and they come spilling out. And other viruses don't ever break cells open. They can move from cell to cell or they exit uh, without cell lysis. Here's an example of an HIV-infected T cell which is releasing virions by budding. And curiously, uh, these are being released in a very specific part of the cell. Only one of the domains of the plasma membrane is releasing virions, nothing else. Remember, the whole cell is infected, but the, the budding process is, di is directed towards one portion, a very specific use of, of concentrating viral components. Uh, the, the, the leaving of particles from cells is very controlled. <laughs> it, viruses can, when cells in us are polarized, typically they have apical and basal lateral domains. Viruses can leave at the top. They can leave through the sides of the cells, the lateral domains of the cells. They can do both. And some viruses will bud from beneath the cells or be released from beneath the cells. And this is very important for pathogenesis. And this is something that we will get back to later. How where a virus is released controls the kind of disease that it's going to cause. Here's another example of polarized release of virus. Here's an axon which is infected with a herpes virus. And we can tell that by the staining because the virus uh, is encoding a fluorescent protein. And uh, you can see that the virus is being released at the axon terminus. And these epithelial cells, in turn, are being infected. So a very specific, directed release of virus uh, from this type of cell. Cells lice for a variety of reasons after virus infection. Uh, the virus can inhibit all sorts of cellular processes that cause it to lyse. The apoptosis uh, can be induced. And there are also some virus-specific mechanisms. There's viral proteases that uh, mess up the cells so that they begin to lyse, glycoproteins, and general damage of the cell. So when we think about pathogenesis, which is what we're going to do from this point on, this is going to be part of the component of, of viruses causing disease, how they uh, lyse the cells. Now, as I said before, not all viruses lyse cells. And if they're not a budding virus, then we have to figure out how they get out of the cell. So here's one example of that. There's some evidence that, well, poliovirus in general lyses the cells that it infects. But there's some evidence that there's also some release of virus in the absence of lysis. 
And this is one mechanism by which this is thought to occur. When poliovirus and related viruses infect cells, the cells respond by uh, inducing the autophagy pathway. They begin to form uh, vesicles, double membrane vesicles that encompass the cytoplasm. The virus actually takes advantage of this uh, by replicating its genome on the surface. These are the vesicles that the virus replicates its RNA genome on. Uh, but the virus also antagonizes the fusion of these autophagosomes with lysosomes, which happens late in, in this uh, pathway. And actually, these, these vesicles end up capturing virus particles and bringing them to the cell surface and releasing them. So normally, the autophagy pathway captures the cytoplasm, digests it, and then brings it and throws it out. The idea, I guess, being that it's recycling cells that are going to be killed anyway, so you might as well give up your amino acids for other cells. But polio interdicts, it blocks lysosome fusion, and has its virions come out at the cell surface. Pretty clever use of the autophagy, both for replicating your genome and for um, bringing your particles outside. The last thing I want to show you is this cool virus, Ascidianus convivitor virus. This is a virus of archaea, you know, these, this third kingdom of life. And uh, this was, virus was found in a hot acidic spring in Italy, pH 1 and a half, 85 to 93 degrees centigrade. Pla good place to take a field trip, right? Go collect viruses. Anyway, this virus, when it's mature, it's, it looks like this, really unusual. It's got a lemon-shaped uh, body and it, these, these tails on either side. When these viruses are released from cells, and the host is archaea again, looks like this on the right. It doesn't have any tails. And then it matures extracellularly, <coughs> and these tails grow. So what's going on here? Well, there must be precursor proteins that are doing this, because I don't believe that any translation is happening in this virion. Remember, because virions don't encode the translation apparatus. So this is kind of an extreme example of maturation of a particle outside of the cell. We talked about how retroviruses do this. They mature outside of the cell, but in comparison, this is pretty extreme. All right, so now we have gone through an infectious cycle. And if you stopped learning virology at this point, you would have no clue about how viruses cause disease. <laughs>